Merry Christmas, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer, in the name of Jesus. Amen. From our family devotional for Sunday, January 3rd. Seeking, seeing our King. After listening to the King, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen went and it, uh, went, when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they fell down and worshipped him. Matthew chapter 2. Picture the scene. Mary and Jesus in the house of an ordinary day. Mary was probably cooking or cleaning. Most likely, Jesus was playing on the floor, maybe with a toy Joseph had made for him. It was simple, homely scene. They didn't know the wise men were coming. I wonder if the wise men were any better or prepared for what they saw. Either way, they did exactly the right thing. They fell down and worshipped him. They saw their real king, the real son of God, playing with his toddler's clothes. And they were happy and celebrated. We too see our real king, our real savior, in the humble baby in the tiny manger, in the man in dusty robes who walked the roads of Galilee and Judea, and the man hanging on the cross, our cross, to bring us life and forgiveness, and in the risen Jesus who left the grave to be with us forever. This is our king, and this is our God. Hallelujah. I like the way that opens. Picture it. Picture this. It says, picture it. How many of you remember Golden Girls? I've, 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 I've always wanted to do this, so I'm going to do it. Ready? Picture it. Sicily, 1912. You know what I'm talking about if you know that show. But let's picture it for a minute. Picture it. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Beth 3, 2, 1 BC. Somewhere in that picture. We know that the wise men didn't arrive at the manger. Uh, they arrived at the home of Jesus, so he was probably already a couple years old. But picture it. Here they are, and they arrive to this home, and outside the home are these stately guards dressed in garments of gold shields with big, big um, weapons to protect the king who's inside. And man, they are humbled. And they go up and they knock on the door, and they are announced as they enter the room, and there on this golden throne sits this tiny little boy with a big crown, and all these people around him maybe waving a fan to keep him cool. That's how it was, right? Somebody's saying back there, no. What do you mean? This, this was King Jesus. What do you mean? That's not how it was. What? Do you think those three wise men, do you think maybe they were a little surprised when they thought they were going to see this king, this wonderful king whose star had risen, and whom they followed, and they get up to this plain, small house? Uh, did the GPS tell us the wrong way? Um, I think we took a wrong turn in Toledo. I don't know. But something was different. Can you imagine as they walked to the door and knocked? The door opened. And there's a little baby, toddler, playing with maybe a toy on the floor. Hello. We're here to see the king. Where is he? Can you imagine that? But that didn't stop them, did it? No. In fact, they knew that was Jesus the moment they saw him, and they bowed down and worshipped him and presented him with fine and wonderful gifts. Pretty powerful, isn't it? You know, as I think about it, Jesus kind of did that, didn't he? Here's Jesus, the King of heaven and earth, the almighty ruler. We have no king but Jesus. We have no ruler but Jesus. No earthly ruler or president can even compare to that. Jesus is our king. And we're saved because of our king. But he didn't live like a king, did he? No, he did. He walked around in robes, getting his feet dirty and dusty, eating normal food, sleeping from house to house, sometimes not having a place to even lay his head born in a manger, if we go all the way back, around cattle, sheep, stinky poop. Ugh. Not for me. And then this Jesus, I think about him on Palm Sunday. You know, usually when kings rode into town, it was for a, it was a big parade and a white stallion to show victory and power. No, Jesus rode into town on a donkey. 
this is your king? The king who showed up for the mockery of a trial, and even from Pontius Pilate, this is your king? The king who had a throne in the shape of a cross that brought him torture and a crown with thorns bleeding down his brow. The king that died and went to hell for us. Kind of an odd king, isn't it? Not where we expect a king to be. But isn't this how God works? God uses the things of this world to reach us. When God is involved, we know it's true because when God is involved, we know it's true. It's simple, it's beautiful, and yet it is powerful. Jesus is our king. And here's what that king did. On the third day of lying on the, in that tomb, he rose to glorious life, and there we see him shine in his brightness with light an exorbitant light. There we see him with the crown of eternal life bursting forth into the victory that he had won for his people. Not his own victory, yes it was, but a victory he won for you and for me. A victory he won to share with us. A victory he won so that we will be with him in his kingdom forever. A victory he won of his eternal kingdom that in baptism he gives to you and for me and to you and to me so that we can have his kingdom too. We are part of that kingdom and we have inherited that same kingdom and victory. Jesus had made, has made us partakers of his kingship and his lordship. Sometimes in this world we get fascinated too much with the big, the beautiful, the bold, the powerful. We see it in politics. We see it in our lives. We see it in people who... <laughs> I once served a church in a very wealthy suburb of Ohio. It was one of the... Cleveland. It was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my life. And I don't want to talk more about that. But what was odd is you saw these people who drove expensive cars, like big, expensive cars, but they lived in tiny homes. Or even more so, I remember going to people's houses in that, that, that place at Christmas time, and they would have these big, immaculate, like, mansions, right? And there would, would be caterers and everything and beautiful furniture, and then going back a couple months later, and they had no furniture. They rented furniture to put on a good show for Christmas, for gatherings, but then they couldn't afford to live like that the rest of the year. We get infatuated with the big, with the big, right? We get infatuated with our job titles, with our educational titles, with our degrees, with our income. We get infatuated that we think we know more than other people. We get infatuated with the big, the bold, and the beautiful, right? Look through catalogs. Look at advertisements. Look at the commercials on TV. The people are advertising clothes to you. They're skinny. The guys have their six-packs. We need kegs. The girls have their bikinis on. Look at them. Fact infatuated with the big, the bold, and the beautiful. Not so with Jesus. Humble. Full of humility. Lowly. Not powerful and big, but loving and gentle. Not narcissistic or a liar, but a truth teller and a healer. Not making it about himself, but making it about you and you and you and you and me and everyone. For God so loved the whole world. I know about you. But I thank God for the small things. I thank him for the dusty, dirty Jesus. Because you know why? When we get rid of all the glitz and glamour and big and beautiful and bold, Every one of us are dirty, rotten, filthy sinners at our core. We do not deserve God's salvation. We don't deserve his love. We're all sinners, lost forever without Jesus. But thanks be to God that he deigned to come down to this earth into our muck and mire surrounded by poo in a cattle stall, lived a life with dust and dirt on his feet, worked as a, as a carpenter before he became a, a, a minister, suffered and was uh, through trials and tribulations because of people around him who thought they were better than him, was battered and bruised and then hung on a cross to die and then rose from the dead to assure us his victory. Thanks be to God for that Jesus, because if he would not have come into our miserable, rotten, sinful, filthy lives, we'd be left to dead. But we're not. 
because of him, we have been cleaned. All of our sin and filth has been removed as far as the east is from the west. We have been polished as made as white as snow in the Father's sight. We are Jesus in the Father's sight. Perfect, righteous, restored. So that when God looks at us, he no longer sees our sinfulness, but see his beloved children. And what a precious gift that is. You see, don't worry if you don't have everything. And don't worry if your life is all put together. And don't worry if it's not perfect. Because who really wants that anyways? I can tell you from what I've already told you, and you can probably guess it too, those lives are fake. But be where you are. And be real. Be where you are and use what you have, your gifts and abilities and treasures, to show people the love of Jesus. For after all, he didn't expect us to rise up in perfection. No, he came into our perfection to make us perfect. Just where you are, are at right now today, you are perfect to your God. Rest in that. Hold on to that and rejoice in it. For it is your gift for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.